Merle wasn't going to be here, so I'm Merle and then I'm Alan, okay? Just so you know. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 12 to 16. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the way they were to take. You came down on Mount Sinai, you spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right, and decrees and commands that are good. You made known to them your, Sabbath, your holy Sabbath, and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger you gave them bread from heaven, and in thirst you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in and take possession of the land that you had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. But they, our ancestors, became arrogant and stiff-necked, and they did not obey your commands. So be it. If you'll bow with me in prayer, we'll begin. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the freedom that we have in this country to worship you, the freedom that we have in Christ to, to live for King Jesus, to see how marvelous and how wonderful our Savior's love is for us, Father. Or to not, it's our choice, Father. You've created us in your image to choose right from wrong. And to help us not to forget that we are chosen by you to be a holy people set apart to obey your commands, to be a light for this world. And it's not something we do ourselves because we cannot obtain heaven and we can't walk this holy life that you require. But because of your spirit, Father, if we will live and by your word, if we'll read, if we'll study, if we'll be united together, if we'll walk in step with the spirit, then we can be like Christ in this world and make a difference. Father, I do thank you today for mothers. I thank you that I had a good mother that gave up so much to, to pray and to teach me and to send me to a Christian school and everything else, Lord. I thank you for your sovereignty, for your love and your care that you provide us that we fail to recognize and thank you for so, much, so often. Open our, our ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church and help us to be obedient. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I entitled this, I'm Bound for the Promised Land. You should have read this week Numbers chapter 26 to 36, Matthew chapter 2 through 6, the book of Jonah, and 1 Kings 1 through 5. And I was kind of surprised when we read 1 Kings because I expected to go into Joshua next, but we didn't. But you know what happened from Numbers. We're to the Promised Land, and God is faithful and the children will inherit the promised land, but look at all that we've read in the Old Testament thus far with all the examples of God's children who were not obedient, who did not follow Him, who did not walk in His ways. And yet God is still faithful to His promise, and it all points to Jesus Christ. If you read your devotions this week, I want to highlight a couple things from May 8th and May 9th. May 8th is entitled The Spirit's Power, and May 9th is called Perfect Sympathy. May 8th's verse is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I go to that verse quite often because it's the last thing that Jesus said to us. And we don't understand in, in this country so much the things of kings and kingdoms, but all that you read through the Bible, you see this theme of kings and kingdoms because you will serve one king and serve his kingdom, or you will serve another. And you're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. And you're either gathering or you're scattering. It's an either or. There's no gray. There's no middle road. There is one way, one truth, and one life, and that is to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. And Acts 1.8, in contrast to what his disciples were asking him, even at the point where he had, in his risen body, had ta taught them for 40 days about the kingdom of heaven, they still ask, are you going to restore the kingdoms of this world at this time? Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said to them, you don't need to worry about that. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And I have to think about it that every day as I deny myself, take up my cross and follow after Jesus. That it's not about this world. It's about how I live for Jesus in this world. The differences I make for the kingdom that's why Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Our Father's will be done, not our will be done. Let us be satisfied with daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, because if we don't stand firm, fixed on Jesus Christ, we may fail to enter the promised land, even though we think we're bound for it. That devotion talks and says, Without the Spirit, the books of Acts would not have happened. 
few weeks previously, uh, the disciples were huddled in a room scared as Jesus walked through the, door, through the locked doors to come and tell them that he had been risen from the dead. Following Jesus' ascension, the Holy Spirit did descend. Jesus said that he would send a comforter, that we would never be alone. He would never forsake us. Do you walk in step with God's Spirit each and every day? Is he transforming you, sanctifying you through and through to be more and more like Christ in this world? And it goes on to say that the story that Jesus started has not finished. Acts says that, that it's a continuation of all the things that Jesus began to do and will continue to do through his people. The Spirit wasn't given so that you and I could sit around and tell other Christians about spiritual experiences. The Spirit was given so that we could walk in step with the Spirit, realizing that we are spiritual beings in this body until we're changed into our new body when we meet Jesus at death or his coming. God calls you to love and to serve even those with whom you share no common earthly citizenship. We must be, be transformed by a power outside of ourselves. And I'm going to add living in us. We are God's temple. We are His kingdom of holy priests. So May 9th, the verse was Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. He had to be made like His brothers and sisters in every respect so that He might become merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. That's whose kingdom that you're, that you're in. To make propitiation for the sins of the people, for because He Himself has suffered when tempted, He is able to help those who are being tempted. Many of us are discouraged by the regularity with which we face temptation. Being temp tempted is not in itself a sin, but yielding to temptation can. Jesus is perfectly able to sympathize with our struggles. When you are most aware of the temptations that face you and are most aware of your weaknesses, that's the time that you can rely on the Spirit even more. Turn instead to the great high priest who tells you that temptations are to be resisted and who provides the power to enable you to do that. Battle your own temptations as you strive to obey Him today. So as I start off, I'm going to ask you, what are your temptations? What are your struggles? Are you being obedient? Are you living a life worthy of the call? Are you bound for the promised land? This will be the third week that I've said this, but all of the people that left Israel thought they were going to enter into the promised land. No one would have said at that point in time, hey, we're going on this journey, but we're not going to make it. Thank goodness our children will, but we're not going to because we're going to not fix our eyes on God. We're not going to be faithful. Instead, they said, we will obey you. We hear your commands. We will obey. You can't own your own might. If you rely on your own might, you will fall into temptation. It's a daily struggle that we fight, a spiritual battle. But God has given us the power to be like Christ in this world. So you've got to fix your eyes on Jesus. You've got to know where the destination is. And you've got to know what your job is. And that's to be a light to the world. To be the hands and feet. To tell people about the kingdom of God. And to usher in the, kingdoms of God, the kingdom of God. To fight injustice. To fight poverty. Whatever it is. To realize when somebody is hurting and suffering. And go to them and do what you need to do that the Spirit is leading you to do. I hope you're reading and following your devotions. Last week we stopped at Numbers chapter 21 where the children of Israel had been tested in the wilderness. They sent out uh, their spies into the land, and they brought back a cluster of grape carried between two people. I cannot even imagine that. Can you imagine taking a grape up this big and eating on it and saying this comes from the land that God has promised us? Do you realize what things he has for store? No, you don't. Scripture tells us that. The things that God has prepared for us we cannot even imagine. But you can think about them. You can long for them. You can fix your eyes on it. You can thank Jesus every day. You can thank God. You can call on the power of the Spirit to live a life and to tell others the hope that you have. They were tested, and poisonous snakes came because they grumbled. They were testing Christ. Scripture tells us that. And all they had to do, I like how the NLT says it, Numbers 21, verse 8, Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to the pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. Wow. 
if you'll simply fix your eyes on this serpent that has been raised up on this bronze pole. How much more do those verses mean in Hebrew when it says to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith? If you want to walk by faith, you can't rely on anything other than Jesus to walk by. In John chapter 3, Jesus said in verse 14, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the, man, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. Wow! For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that everyone who believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because He has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And this is the verdict. The light has come into the world, but men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. And I'm going to finish reading a few more verses there, but I stop here at this and ponder, and I ponder with what I read in the devotions, how am I suffering for Jesus? I ponder that all the time. Because I think so many times I'm already in a land flowing with milk and honey. I mean, look around us. And if we don't, don't fix our eyes on Jesus, we're going to be focused on this. This is not our land. This is not our home. We are bound for the promised land. Don't get distracted. Maybe your struggles are being too complacent in this world rather than getting out and taking a chance for Jesus. Maybe you're not struggling with drugs or alcohol or anything else. Maybe you're not struggling to read God's Word and spend time in prayer, but are you being doers of the Word? When you see an opportunity, are you passing it by? Or are you grabbing and seizing that opportunity to be a witness and a light for this world and making a difference? If we truly acted like Christ in this world, this world would be different than it is right now. The light has come in the world, but men love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. If I sit in my easy chair and watch television because I'm too lazy to get out and work for the kingdom, then I like the dark rather than the light. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come in the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever practices the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen clearly that what he has done has been accomplished in God. Holiness. To live a life that is holy, to bring about God's justice and sovereignty in this world, to be a difference, to be a light, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So how are you doing that? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for who, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross... What are you envisioning that you should be doing to, to love Jesus more? Where should you be serving? How should you be doing it? What should you be suffering that you might have to give up of your time, of your money, of your talents? Even the fact that, oh, I don't want to go talk to that person over there because I don't really like them. Whatever it is. What is keeping you from serving God totally? Because if you fix your eyes on Jesus, before the joy set before Him, He endured the cross scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So what does a life lived by fixing your eyes on Jesus look like? What does it look like for you personally? Is there something that you're not doing that you should be doing? Are there missed opportunities? If you keep on reading in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, Pursue peace with everyone, as well as holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no root of bitterness springs up to cause trouble and defile many. Now I'm thinking back to all this wandering in the wilderness, aren't I? See to it that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who in that moment thought that a cup of soup was more important than his birthright. Who for a single meal sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He could find no ground for repentance, though he sought the blessing with tears. Are you bound for the promised land? Are you firmly fixed in Jesus? Are you 
traveling forward as the Spirit of God leads you through whatever the wilderness is in your life. Keep on reading in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, and I'm going to read through into chapter 13. Therefore, since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us be filled with gratitude and so worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe, what Israel failed to do, right? For our God is a consuming fire. We see that time and time again as we will read the wilderness story. Continue in brotherly love. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some have entertained angels without even knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were bound with them, and those who are mistreated as if you were suffering with them. Well, there's a good pattern right there for what a Christian's life ought to look like, is it? Brotherly love, hospitality to anyone. Remember those in prison, not just because they're suffering for the kingdom, but for whatever it is. There's that prison ministry out there that, that we can say praises to God that our mother came in at age 80 or even our enemy came in at age 80 and came to know Jesus Christ. And those who are mistreated as if you were suffering with them. So many times in this world we want to blame the fact that someone is mistreated or suffering on what they did already. Shame on you. <laughs> You're not worthy of God's grace, but He gives it freely to all those who accept it. Don't ever point your fingers at someone else because of what they're going through. After the snake incident, they were tested and, and many of them died. The children of Israel began their journey on to Moab. It appears as the journey is going well, but is it? Because remember, they start conquering different kingdoms and stuff. But they, that generation has already been told by God they are not entering the promised land. So we go about so much of our, our things in this world and we don't fix our eyes on Jesus and we think all these things are good and we're, we're in a land of plenty because we are a child of God. There's where I have problems where I got conflict. How am I suffering then for the kingdom? If I have so much, if I am rich, how am I richly blessing others? How am I being a good steward with everything I have? Or am I just fat and lazy and happy and say, God loves me? I struggle with that all the time. How am I suffering for the kingdom? What am I giving up? Where is the opportunity that you're showing me today, Lord, to serve? Numbers chapter 22 to 24. Israel gets seduced again, don't they? Balak, king of Moab, sees the conquest that they're doing, and he's scared, and he summons what looks like to be a prophet of God, but who is a false prophet, to curse the Israelites instead of to bless them. And if only he'd listened to the words of his donkey, right? He can't curse Israel. He can only bless them. But he has time to repent, and does he truly repent? And do the people of God repent and turn to him? Thirty-eight years they wander in the desert after the time they came and spies went into the land where they were supposed to conquer, to take the land over. Thirty-eight years. Do you know if you look back and read that scripture, the pillar of fire and the uh, pillar of clouds not mentioned after that point? But if you read in Nehemiah, Nehemiah's prayer, it says that the pillar of cloud of fire never left them. So I've sat and contemplated and I've studied this all week. Where was that pillar of fire? We know it's there. Jesus is with us every step of the way. But so many times we say, where are you, Lord? Because I'm suffering this in my life. My prayers aren't being answered this way. He's right there. He cares. He'll never forsake you. And the Spirit of God lives inside of you so that you can live like a child of God in this foreign land until you reach the promised land. And so much greater is the land that he has for us in store. We cannot fathom those things. Numbers 25 and 26, praise God for his faithfulness. Even though Moab is seduced, there is a new numbering of God's children. Thank goodness for his faithfulness. Every time that I pray for my children and my grandchildren, I pray for God's faithfulness to come to them no matter where they're at in their life right now. But he will come to them and they will hear his call and they will answer his call. And I pray that they become mightier men and women for God than I ever have been. And then I ask God to forgive me for all the times that I have failed him and I should have led them better 
through this wilderness. Numbers 27 to 36, Joshua will lead this new number into the promised land. It happens. But they still have to fight for it, don't they? It's still a battle that they have to fight. Caleb at 80 years old, praise to God, to give him strength to go and fight the giants in the land. Numbers chapter 16, verse 41 to 42. The next day the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people, they said. But when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned the... Turn towards the tent of meeting. Suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. That's the last time you will read about the cloud in Numbers. There the people are turning against their leaders. They're wanting to elect new leaders to lead them back to Egypt. The land that God took them from by His mighty power, the finger of God, the death came, but life came to those who... To, who uh, painted the blood on their doorpost of the Lamb. All this points to Jesus. All Scripture points to Jesus. Praise God for Jesus Christ, your Savior, your Lord, your King. But is He? And now they longingly want to go back. And don't forget the reason that God called them out in the wilderness was to train up a people that would properly worship Him and be a light to other nations that have already been condemned because of their wickedness. The water, the bread, the, all the incidents, all the pointing to Jesus if we would just simply see God's grace. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 6, For I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ so how are you on your journey to the promised land O oh Christian are you grumbling are you complaining are you looking back or are you firmly fixed on where your destination is and the one who is leading you there because verse 5 says nevertheless God was not pleased with most of them their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So now I have to contemplate, well, what evil things, Lord? I'm not this, I'm not that. Oh, but wait a minute, like I said, there's so many times where I'm complacent. There's so many times that I fail to be passionate about my prayer for others. There's so many times that I'm like, oh, Lord, this is not in my timing. And I start to lose focus of fixing my eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 1 starts out this way. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things and through whom all he, also He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word, after he had provided purification for sin, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now you started reading Matthew. We started actually the week before, but you read Matthew chapter 2 through 6 this week. Are you paying attention to what Jesus taught? Are you paying attention to what he did? You should have started reading the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus' words blew away the religious people that came to see him. Were they religious hypocrites or those who were desperately seeking? Because they thought of this things the same way that I just told you. I'm not a murderer. But what did Jesus say? <laughs> uh, maybe I'm not an adulterer, but what did Jesus say? And what did he tell you to do? How did he tell you to live your life? Totally different than you lived your life before, totally counterculturally different than the world around you so that people see Jesus Christ, so that they see God in you. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 4, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, what have I told you that I'm going to there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. 
Well, you know, it is wonderful that the children inherited the promised land. It is such a blessing. But wouldn't you want to go in with them? Wouldn't you want it to be leading them? Wouldn't you want to be riding on the doorpost of your house, your tent, whatever it was that you're wandering in at that time, to, to fix your eyes on the Lord, to obey His commands, that He is a good God that loves us so much? Or would you want to be teaching them your hypocrisy by longingly looking back to the land of the foreign gods in Egypt? It is all about the destination, but don't forget the way getting there because you'll never reach the destination if you don't find the way there. 800 years after the wandering in the wilderness, Nehemiah wrote these words. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 12 through 22. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire. Why? Here's a prepositional phrase. To give them light on the way they were to take. So I have to go back and say, well, what the, the 38 years? Well, I don't see the pillar. I know it's there. Well, the reason that I'm not reading about it is because they weren't fixing their eyes on leading them. They already let, they lost view, view of their destination. They're not going to reach it, excuse me. But it's still there. The hope is still there. The hope is there for their children. But they didn't look at the light to lead them there, did they? You came down on Mount Sinai, you spoke to them from heaven, you gave them regulations and laws that are just and right and decrees that are co and commands that are good. Verse 14, you made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger, you gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst, you brought them water from the rock, which we already read is Christ. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with your uplifted hand to give them. Verse 16. But they, our ancestors, became arrogant, stiff-necked, and they did not obey your commands. They all thought they were going to enter the promised land. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles that you performed among them. They became stiff-necked in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore you did not desert them. That pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire was always there. But if you're not looking for it, you're looking towards someone else, aren't you, other than Jesus? And you'll lose your way. And you might not reach the land that God has promised you. Verse 18, even when, they even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf and said, This is our God who brought you out of Egypt, or when they committed awful blasphemies, because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. By day the pillar of cloud did not fail to guide them on their path, nor their pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. I wonder if the children actually saw it. You know, they... Sometimes children say they see an angel or whatever, and us in all of our wisdom, we don't see these things. Just, just a thought. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths. You gave them water for their thirst. For 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. You gave them kingdoms and nations. But the parents didn't enter the promised land. The children did. Just something to think about as you fix your eyes on Jesus and you lead your children home. God calls all of His people to repentance. He wants none to suffer whatsoever. You read Jonah, didn't you? <laughs> wow, why could Jonah not see that? Instead, he runs the opposite way, doesn't he? But God's with him the whole time, and the people on the ship even come to know Jehovah God, don't they? Because God's going to use you whichever direction that you run if you're His child. But He's calling you one direction. Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus, and are you going in that direction? Jonah 1, verses 1 through 3, The, Lord of the, word, came, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amity. Go to this great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because it's... Its wickedness has come up before me. Before judgment, there's a time of repentance. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. You know what Jonah's name means? I love doing word studies because when I do, I'm like, <laughs> this is so cool. 
His name means dove. And his father's name means my truth. If only he had listened to the truth from his father and followed the guidance of the Holy Spirit in his life, he would have went straight to Nineveh. But instead he had animosity in his heart towards who and why? His enemy? So as you read these words again from, from Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, think of what Jesus tells you to love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, He went up out of the water. At the moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending on Him like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, and whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, this is chapter 4, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Into the wilderness, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Look at the parallel things there to the wilderness and the children of Israel. They did, were not satisfied with the bread that came down from heaven. That They called, What is it? That's what manna means. It was like honey in their mouth. But yet... We got tired of the same old thing, weren't we? We're not satisfied with daily bread, as Jesus goes on to tell us in the Lord's Prayer. But, but Jesus tells us clearly that we don't need to worry about physical bread. We need to worry about spiritual bread that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then he tells Satan, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. We just talked about that where they died with because they wouldn't fix their eyes on the serpent that was raised up on the pole. Then Jesus says to Satan, he says, Away from me, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The whole reason that the children of Israel were taken out of Egypt was to worship and serve the Lord their God. Hmm. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is verse 11. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come. Are you following the light? Are you fixed firmly on following Jesus? Are you living for Him, obeying His command, loving others because God first loved you so you can even love your enemies? As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were sitting, casting a net into the lake. They were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And after the call, here's the reaction. At once they left their nets and followed Him. You know, God told Jonah to go fish for men, didn't He? But instead He had to be swallowed by a fish to see the light, didn't He? If you're God's, He's going to use you. I'm going to say that again, no matter what. And maybe some of the things, the temptations you're, you're going through and the sufferings that you think you have are simply because you're not fixing your eyes on Jesus. Maybe they're not. Paul said also these other things that happen are light and momentary. If it wasn't because he was in prison, we wouldn't have a lot of the Word of God that we have. In this world you will suffer. Do not be surprised. But God is with you. The suffering is not the end. 
The suffering leads you out of the wilderness into the promised land. The suffering is a place in the wilderness where you can hear God's word, where you can see his guidance if you'll only look. Jonah 1 verse 17, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Oh, more pointing to Jesus, isn't it? (laughs) Who suffered and died, but death has no sting, because he rose again on the third day. And if you believe in him, then death has no sting for you. It's the passing into the promised land. Matthew 12, verse 38 to 41. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What a prophet. He ran the other way. God had a fish swallow him when he threw it in. He thought he was going to just die and end it all. And then he was spit up on the land and he went in and preached a sermon that was eight words. (laughs) That's it. And God used him mightily to save a pagan nation. We talked about the prayers of mothers and why you're here today. Don't forget that, mothers. Don't forget that, fathers. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. None will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it because they believed. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now something greater than Jonah is here. If a pagan nation repented and turned to God because of eight words from a guy that probably looked like he was death warmed over if he'd been in the belly of a fish for three days, how much more will people listen to you if you have a changed life and tell them about Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. Verse 48, he replied to them, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here is my mother and here are my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and my, um, is my brother and sister and mother. I told you you also read 1 Kings. First and second kings are a continued work, one continuous work, talking about the kings and kingdoms that got established after David and how these kings and kingdoms were supposed to live to bring glory in this world so that others could see what a kingdom and a king does. But we have constant failure. So we fix our eyes on Jesus, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords, and what His kingdom looks like. But we also in this world, since we are children of that kingdom, we live for justice. We live for what is right. We live for the fact that, and the Acts Church proves it, that we sell our things if we have to so that there are no needy people among us. We live differently than the world around us. Do we? David has firmly established his kingdom. And as you read, you see he's teaching Solomon, which is strange and weird, to take vengeance on his enemies. And Solomon makes an allegiance with the, the, king, the king of Egypt and marries his daughter. I don't know. I just scratched my head. But it's for us to look at and learn. We'll, we'll go that sermon a different day. But we do know that Solomon, because we've already read it, said, Hevel, hevel, hevel. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. It's only a vapor. It's only a mist, this life. And if you chase after everything under the S-U-N, you're going to find it meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. But since we see Jesus through scriptures, if we fix our eyes on the S-O-N and living for him, everything can have meaning, 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 whether you understand it today or not. That your life has purpose and meaning. That's why you were created. That is why you are here. And your life was bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So what is the meaning that you're living for? Who is the king that you're serving? Whose kingdom are you advancing? In Matthew chapter 5, after Jesus has told them that they needed to repent for the kingdom of heaven is here and he has called out men to fish for him and they've left this world behind then that's when he begins teaching these crazy blessings blessings are when you 
blessed are you when, and you can go back and read them, you are totally different than what you thought before. You are totally different than the world around you. When you realize it's not about yourself, but it's all about God, and you were created to worship and honor and serve Him and to offer spiritual sacrifices pleasing to Him. You are the salt and light of the world. Are you? You are to love instead of holding on to bitterness and anger. You're partway through. You read Matthew chapter 7 today. I asked you to go back and read it and read it again and ask Jesus what he's saying to you as if you were on that mountainside. I got to go to Israel several years ago and I'm looking, but I don't have one of the men here with me today that did. And we sat on a hillside that could very well have been that hillside. And the preacher that we had that was leading the tour, he did not use his Bible. He, from memory, did the Sermon on the Mount. It was incredible. But what would it be good for me if I heard it and didn't become a doer of it? Jonah didn't understand what God was calling him to do. He didn't understand the privilege that he had. Hopefully he figured it all out. So I have to ask myself, do you understand Alan? You have to ask yourself that. Because so many times we get caught up in the wilderness and think it's the promised land. Matthew chapter 6, just a few points. So when you give to the needy, when you pray, this is how you should pray. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins when you fast. Do not store for up for yourself treasures on earth, but store for yourself treasures in heaven. No one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, you drink, or your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Alan, are you doing all these things? Is this how you view your life in Christ? Are you blessed? From Mount Sinai, God called His children in Exodus 9, 5, and 6. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Moses told that to God's people and they said, Yes, we will follow you to the promised land. Moses didn't enter the promised land, did he? Jesus calls to us from heaven instead of Mount Sinai in the book of Revelation. He calls to his brothers and sisters... Revelation chapter 1, 5, and 6, And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of this earth, to him who loves, you, loves us and has freed us from sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And then we have the letters to the churches. And the last one is don't be complacent. Don't be lukewarm. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You won't reach where you think you're going to reach that promised land if you continue in your complacency. Father, forgive me for being complacent. Forgive me for not fixing my eyes on Jesus as much as I should. Forgive me for being more of a hearer than a doer. If you're a kingdom of priests... Then I want to just briefly give you seven things, and I'm going to close with this, to think about what a priest, of, of king, a kingdom of priests should do. Number one, they're called. It's nothing you did. You're called to do the job, and you answer the call or not. 
Come and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets to follow Jesus. They did not look back. And Jesus even tells us later after he tells us we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross, follow after him. He says if anybody longingly looks back, they're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. What are you called to do? To be set apart and holy to God, belonging to him and his kingdom. That's what you're called to do. Number two, you're a representative of God to people and you offer spiritual sacrifices on their behalf. That's what you do. That's what your life should look like. Look back at the Old Testament again and how many offerings, how much blood had to be given. You're covered by the blood of the Lamb. So are you suffering and giving up a little bit and offering to God or are you holding on to everything? Do you say, how much do I have to give? Is 10% enough? Is that what I'm required? Or are you going to be like Jesus and He said, give it all. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me to death because it leads to life. Number three, you have to live by faith, not by sight. Fixing your eyes on that pillar, don't you, which is Jesus Christ. Number four, you must be not only a hearer of God's word, but you have to hear and obey, don't you? That's number five. You have to be an obeyer of God's word. Number six, you are to usher in God's kingdom, making a difference. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Fighting sin and injustice in this world. And number seven, what is a kingdom of priests called to do? Finish their work and go home. Is that where you're at, O oh Christian? Is that where we're at as a church? As you read, you'll read more of the history of the kings and kingdoms of Israel, and you'll read more of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, as written by Matthew. One who left his tax collector booth, left the riches of this world. What would happen to him as a, as a result of walking away from Caesar to serve this new king? Immediately he got up from his tax collector booth, and he followed after Jesus so he could fish for men. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the work of Jesus Christ in his flesh and blood, for being, for humble himself, for, for, for gladly going to the cross so that he could save me. Father, my prayer is that everyone here knows Jesus as their Savior and Lord and that we live it, that we live it together as a people, part of the children of the kingdom of God, that we don't get caught up in the things of this world, but we fix our eyes on Jesus and we walk by faith and lead our children home. Father, I do thank you today for mothers. I thank you that my mother went to work so that she could send me to a Christian school. I thank you for the testimonies we've heard of the other mothers and I thank you for hearing every single prayer. Father, we know that you are sovereign in all ways and you, we know that Scripture tells us that you work out everything for good to those who, who love you. Help us to firmly fix our eyes on Jesus, to consider the words that he says and apply them to our life as we live out this life of faith. Help us to walk in step with the Spirit each and every day, each and every step of the way. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.